As we were talking about the Good Shepherd this morning, it seemed appropriate for the Old Testament passage to go to Psalm 23. It's amazing how much beauty and comfort is packed into six verses. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The preaching text for this morning comes from John 10, 11 to 18, starting in verse 11 then, Jesus is speaking. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I laid down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. It's the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ran into a problem this Sunday morning because uh, liturgically this is Trinity Sunday where we celebrate the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In America, according to the calendar, it's Memorial Day weekend, which is something very important to me. And for Salem, it's the year that I've challenged you to read through the Bible. And I said, any Sunday that I didn't have to dedicate to one particular thing, I go back to this theme of reading through the Bible. Previously, I've preached on Trinity. This first year that I was here with you, I did all the liturgical dates, made sure we hit that church calendar. And last year I preached on the Trinity, and I've been doing that pretty regularly. If you were here, part of that Lenten series that we did, did a lot of work on that concept of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So I decided to break ranks with my normal tradition and not go with the Trinity part of it, but look more at the Memorial Day idea. This is a very important holiday. What used to be a holy day, now we call them holidays. It started out called Decoration Day. Many of you probably know this, but I think it's worth repeating. The story is that uh, after the Civil War was going on and the the women down south were coming out to decorate the graves of their fallen heroes, and some of the ladies noticed the Union graves over there, and they were just abandoned. So they started the practice of decorating both sides, Union and Confederate. Now, that's the Southern story. Where I was down south for four years, that's what I heard. There's a place in Pennsylvania that claims they invented Memorial Day, Decoration Day. I think up in New York, there's probably about a half a dozen places that claim to be the first place to do this. For whatever bragging rights that is, I don't know, but the important thing that shouldn't be missed is how many people gave up their lives. You've heard this phrase, and part of it's on the marquee at the Marva, all gave some and some gave all. Now, Veterans Day, you can thank a vet. That's this all gave some. And don't thank me for being a vet today because it's not my day. This is Memorial Day. This is for those who gave all the ultimate sacrifice. And it started with Decoration Day in the Civil War. And if you didn't know this, we lost about half of all Americans who've ever died in war. It happened during the Civil War. 
the numbers I have are 620,000 dead. Now, in all other wars since then, I mean, from Revolutionary War, 1812, French, everything, right up through Korea, World War II, Korea, and the first Gulf. Now, with the second Gulf War, it went to 644,000. It took the entire history of America up until the last war that we were in to actually equal the number of dead from the Civil War. You think about how that decimated America, you can realize how important Decoration Day was. As we moved on to World War I and II, they changed the name to Memorial Day. We had recently worked through the Bible study, talked about some of the wars in the Old Testament, and they were commenting about how many thousands of people died, and it prompted me to look something up here. The Battle of the Bulge, World War II, there were 75,000 American casualties and upwards of 100 German casualties. The Battle of Iwo Jima, that one battle, cost 12,000 dead, 62,000 wounded total. The War of 1812, 15,000 dead, 23,000 total. We've been through a lot of wars. We've had a lot of men and women make that ultimate sacrifice. So I think Memorial Day is very important, especially for the ultimate gift, which brings me back to today's Bible reading, which I thought was very appropriate for sacrifice. The daily scriptures in John, and today it's laying down his life for his sheep. And he makes a sharp contrast between the good shepherd and the hireling. And I think it's important to note that this hireling isn't a bad guy. He's not the wolf. He's not the thief that comes to kill and destroy. He's there hired to take care of the sheep, but he has no personal interest in him. He's not a bad guy. He's just not committed. We need to think about that when we think about what he's obviously talking about is not sheep, but us. And the shepherds being the pastors and the superintendents and the bishops who are responsible for the sheep. Let's look at the text a little closer. As we've been reading through, we went through the whole idea of the man who was born blind and, and now he sees, so we have that going on. He's arguing with the Pharisees more or less, talking about the good shepherd and the sheep and how it is to get into the pen. He talks earlier about being the gatekeeper. In verse 7, he says, I am the gate. That confuses to a lot of, confusing to a lot of people. A lot of times back in there, the old days, if you figure this was a sheep pen, it'd be circled all around, and there'd be one opening for the sheep to go in and out. Well, they didn't really have a gate. What the shepherd would do is he would lay down in the evening, and he would be at that entrance. He himself would personally become the gate that keeps the bad things out and keeps the good things in. So when he says in verse 7, prior to our text, I am the gate for the sheep. Everyone else has been thieves and robbers. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. A lot of challenge there. But now we get to our text itself. I am the good shepherd. The hired hand is not the shepherd. Not the thief, not a bad guy, just, just not really committed, doing, doing his thing. And he's not going to sacrifice himself. He'll abandon the sheep. When it's no longer convenient to do what serves him, he, he's gone. And then it opens the door for the wolves to attack. Verse 14, he says again, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. He's making a strong contrast there. And remember, he's arguing with the Pharisees those religious leaders who claimed to be leading the sheep. Bring that to the 21st century. I know my sheep, my sheep know me, as the Father knows me and I know them. It was literally a matter of calling them by name and they would come out. I had the privilege of seeing that over in Germany one time. I was living on the economy, a second floor apartment, and, and I heard this bleeding and a dog barking. And I looked at the balcony and there's a shepherd shepherd walking along about 15 feet in front of the sheep and the sheep were just following him right along <laughs> they were his sheep and the dog was running around keeping the stragglers in place it was so cool to literally see a shepherd leading the flock which is so different from herding cattle 
If you're going to drive cattle someplace, you get behind them and you keep pushing them. You push them forward. But a shepherd leads. And by his leading, where he goes, the sheep know him, they have confidence, and they follow. It's a beautiful image there. And then he tells something in verse 16, which is really great for us because I wasn't born Jewish. (laughs) He says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. What do you think he's talking about? Raise your hand. (laughs) Unless you're born Jewish, you know, raise your hand. That's us. So even now, even in this passage, when no one really knows what he's talking about, he's already laying out the plan of being the good shepherd, not just for the chosen people of Israel, but the chosen people of God, us, the other sheep. We'll also listen to his voice, one flock, one shepherd. And that's why I lay down my life. That's why I follow Leslie. I lay down my life only to take it up again. Now, the shepherd that lays down his life, okay, that's, that's very heroic, but that means the sheep have no one to protect them then, not even the hireling. The fact that his heroic and miraculous thing, he laid his life down only that take it up again, even stronger in a different form. No one takes it from me. I've heard this is meant in a good way, but so many people have said at, Chris, at uh, Easter that people came and they took Jesus and they killed him. Jesus laid his life down. He volunteered himself. I lay it down on my own authority. I have the authority to lay it down and take it up again. That is the source of his power as the Father led him. You can imagine, and we talk about this a lot at Bible study, how this was earth-shattering for people to hear this. All along, they've been hearing about Yahweh, singular. I am Lord alone. There is no God before me. There is no consort. There is no female. There is no other God whatsoever. And then Jesus says, I am God. I am that good shepherd that David was talking about when he was relying on his shepherd, God. He's saying he's it. The thief is obviously Satan. The hireling is just a nominal shepherd, which is, of course, code for pastor. Just an average pastor, not not bad, but serving at his or her convenience. There's job security. There's advancement personally. And there's the possibility of social agenda. Now, I was going to try not to get too political with this, but if we're going to bring this to the 21st century, how would that play out? Suppose I'm a sham. Suppose I really have no relationship with God whatsoever, but I've been, you know, working and getting laid off periodically, so I hear about this job at United Methodist, but it's guaranteed. You reach the point of elder, you are guaranteed an appointment someplace full-time. That's not bad. Recession-proof? And suppose I don't really believe the Scriptures, but I have this real concern for society, and I think we should be doing good things for people. You ever you know what a bully pulpit is? This is a bully pulpit what you call a captured audience. I've heard pastors say this. I cringe. They say, with your permission, I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege. Now, who out there is going to be bold enough to say, no, preacher, stay to the text? That's kind of gratuitous. If if it's okay with you all, I'd like to take a little diversion right now. Who's going to challenge that? But if I have a social agenda, here you are. And week after week, I could tell you all about how important it is to do this, that, or the other thing. And we can just close this, and you don't really need it after the opening verse. We actually knew a guy. (laughs) Um, If I'm wrong, God forgive me, but he was in the coal region area where we were up there. And he told the other clergy in his group, his goal was to serve one church and then get out of that and move on to something else. And he was at this one particular church for well over 10, 15 years. And when his time to leave was, he left, went out to Pittsburgh, and was a chaplain in a nursing home. His agenda was to serve as a pastor for a while and then move on to something else. I just don't get that. But it's not unique. The idea that there are weak, nominal, poor, hireling pastors um, is not new to Scripture either. Paul warns that in the book of Acts He's talking to the Ephesian church. He's getting ready to leave them. And he says, even now, I know that when I leave, the wolves will come among you. 
false shepherd, even from your own group. He's telling the church in Ephesus, even from your own church, there's going to be false people rising up to take you away from the truth. Now, how old is this possibility of bad shepherds? Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, talking about the hireling versus the good shepherd. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, he's writing this advice. He says, uh, to the elders among you, I appeal to you, fellow elders, a witness of Christ's suffering who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over them and trusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when a chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. What Jesus was saying here in this passage about the good shepherd and the hireling is very much responsible for today. And it's, it's not just today. It's been the case all the way through history. If you know anything about church history, as we went through it during that Lenten series, that's why we call it the Reformation. There were people who said, this church has gotten so bad, we have to reform and make some major changes because we're not following God. Instead of reforming, the Catholic Church politely booted us out. We've been booted out of some really good places. We were Jewish. We weren't accepted there. We were booted out of the Jewish faith, booted out of the Roman Catholics. But it's that call to be the good shepherd, to assess, to figure out, is this really from God or is it not? It's not just for the pastor. It's just anybody who is a leader, has influence within the church. Are you willing to sacrifice for this? Are you willing to pay some price as she mentioned at jam time, we're not necessarily called, especially in America, we're not called to literally give our life as they are in the Middle East and China and Africa. Often it is a matter of laying down their life. There was a sermon I heard a while back. The preacher made a comment that when he accepted Jesus and went into the ministry, he was about 18 years old, and he was all fired up. He was ready to die for Christ. He could see himself in front of the firing squad and never blinking and willing to die for Christ, and that didn't happen. Another year went by, years went by, and as an old man, I realized that he died a little bit each day as he gave himself away for Christ as a church. So he did give his life, not just one moment, but of a lifetime. Those are the heroes we're celebrating today, Memorial Day. In America, it's the ones that had that moment and, and they paid the ultimate sacrifice. In the spiritual realm, it's the ones who pay the ultimate sacrifice. Give up even a little bit each of themselves each day for the kingdom in order to receive a crown that never fades. Memorial Day. Tomorrow especially, I'm going to ask that you will take a time away from the picnics and the family gatherings and all the stuff that's going on and just pause with you and whoever's with you. Remember the sacrifices that have been made both in our Christian world and the American world and that ultimate sacrifice. Let's pray. Father God, this is a memorable day. We remember those who've died in your service and in service to a country that we belong to. We recognize there's something about that mark in a person's life that is just astonishing and, and worth remembering. May we never get so comfortable and so casual as to think of this as just an extended weekend starting summer a chance to get together with family and friends and take the boat out. God, forgive us if we ever forget that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Thank you, Lord. Amen.